So moving on to this funny condition, multifocal motor neuropathy. And so in 1983, this young man walked into my office. He'd been referred, 27 years old, had been referred to the diagnosis of AMS. Not a good diagnosis to get if you're 27 years old. And a year, about a year, it was about 18 months beforehand, he had, present, he had noticed weakness um, in his right forearm and hand. He'd had wasting. There'd been fasciculations and cramps. Sounds pretty good for motor neuron disease, actually. Um, about a year later, he developed um, similar weakness in the left hand, again with cramps and fasciculations. And that's really all he'd had by the time I saw him. He'd had no bulbar or respiratory symptoms. He'd had no lower limb symptoms. He seemed to recall that he had some vague paresthesias at the very onset of his disease, but they didn't persist. He had no other uh, sensory features. And, and I draw your attention to the examination findings. And, uh, um, what he had was severe weakness and atrophy on the right in the ulna distribution. But his median on that side was normal. On the opposite side, sorry, where is it? Um, oh, incidentally, he was completely unaware of this. He had s severe weakness and atrophy of his right biceps, which there was just a flicker of muscle contraction that must have come on extremely slowly if he had uh, adapted to that and was quite unaware that it was present. Um, and so on the opposite side, he again had severe weakness of phenar muscles. So he had weakness of ulnar innervated muscles on one side, median innervated muscles on the other side, and he had this asymptomatic weakness of biceps. Now one thing I thought was odd, that despite MRC grade three weakness in his phenar muscles, he had normal muscle bulk. I thought that was a bit odd. He did have fasciculations, that was clear, and all other muscle strength was completely normal, other than that I've listed there. The whole bar functions were normal, he had normal sensation and reflexes, other than his uh, biceps germ. And, and so as I say, he'd been diagnosed with ALS. He didn't have increased reflexes. He did have preserved reflexes in a weak limb, but he didn't have increased reflexes. He had no definite upper motor neuron signs at all. But he had some of the, the quintessential features of ALS, of weakness, cramps, and fasciculations. But he'd been going for about two years when I saw him and still had developed no involvement of bulbar, respiratory, lower limb, or proximal upper limb function. Not impossible, I've certainly seen that in patients with ALS, but a bit odd. No definite upper motor neuron signs. And again, this severe weakness without atrophy. And when you analyze it, this is weakness that is in the distribution of individual peripheral nerves. So he had biceps weakness without deltoid spinati or brachioradialis involvement. That's musculocutaneous. That is not a spinal segmental distribution of weakness such as you would get in an anterior horn cell disease. He had weakness in the thenar um, on the left, which is median, but ulna was completely spared on that side. And co conversely, on the right side, he had weakness of ulna without median. So I thought all of this was pretty odd. So what did I do? It's a neuropathy patient. I took him to the EMG lab and this is what I found. <clears throat> I don't think there's anybody in the audience old enough to appreciate this, but this is that old heat sensitive paper that produced terrible tracings and you had to go and trace over them by hand afterwards. Hence some of these rather wobbly lines. But this is just one of his nerves. This is the median motor nerve conduction study showing an absolutely normal distal amplitude. This is the side that had the weakness but no atrophy. And when we stimulated the elbow, we got this miserable looking response here, which when we increased the gain tenfold, <coughs> you can see, is a highly dispersed response. It's about 90% about conduction block in that nerve. And yet when we did sensory nerve conduction, stimulating the median nerve at the first digits, recording of the wrist, elbow, and mid-arm, we got completely normal sensory conduction proceeding through this area of profound motor conduction block. A phenomenon that had never been described before. <coughs> 
In fact, when I presented this first, uh, a very senior professor simply, he just came out and said, I don't believe it. I was a junior professor, and I was a bit intimidated by this, but I stuck to my guns. And we found a couple of other patients and wrote this paper. So multifocal acquired, we called it demyelinating neuropathy. It may not be, it may be a channelopathy unresolved yet, but, but at that time we thought this was demyelinating, masquerading as motor neuron disease. And Stephen Clark worked with me on this and unfortunately he died recently at quite a young age. So, so the original, uh, this initial report sort of <coughs> created a furor. I mean there was these wild claims that perhaps 20% of patients with ALS had a treatable disorder. And when treatment was identified, well, it had a benign disorder, was the first step. And then when we found that IVIG was effective in the treatment of this disorder, they had a treatable disorder. So this created a veritable stampede of patients uh, to neuromuscular clinics from the ALS clinic saying, I, why don't I have the treatment for this condition? Which, as I've said, is IVIG and very expensive. And it's really not that difficult to make the distinction between the two conditions clinically. And, and the nerve conductions will answer the, the question in those who the clinical uh, doubt still exists. But even today, we're still seeing patients who are being give, given false hope and treated with IVIG for ALS. And occasionally we're seeing patients who are being given a diagnosis and a death sentence. You've got ALS, you're gonna die who have a treatable disorder. And I'm gonna present you a couple of those cases. So the first is a 45-year-old man who presented with left hand weakness that pro progressed to really quite severe paralysis quite quickly, for about six months. He had no weakness elsewhere at that time. He had uh, fasciculations in that left arm, but not just in the distal muscles. It was also in the proximal muscles, also across his torso, and some in the proximal muscles of his right upper extremity. Uh, the examination showed this severe weakness, uh, but there was also some weakness in triceps again. So this is not conforming to a specific peripheral nerve territory. This is a spinal segmental pattern of weakness. Um, as I say, he had, he had fasciculations in the torso, which I think is a very important finding and rarely seen in any, any condition other than ALS. Uh, this initial stage, his legs were normal, uh, he still had reflexes in this weak atrophic uh, left arm, but that's not unequivocal upper motor neuron signs. Uh, so perhaps um, the mistake was acceptable. Uh, but this is where the problem occurred. The patient had motor nerve conduction studies that showed I don't have this tracings, unfortunately. He had a 42% amplitude decrement in the median nerve in the forearm. Uh, but the distal amplitude was 1.2 millivolts. And I said in relationship to the CIDP and diabetics patient that when you've got low amplitude, you can get these segmental amplitude changes and they have to be interpreted with great caution. But very importantly, the needle EMG in this patient showed fasciculations throughout both upper limbs and showed fibrillations in muscles that were clinically normal. And that's one of the characteristic features of ALS. And in multifocal motor neuropathy, muscles that are clinically spared do not have fibrillations. It's an absolute. Now, someone's going to present me a case in which that proves me wrong, because whenever you say absolutely, someone can prove you wrong. But if you've got fibrillations in clinically normal muscles, that's not multifocal motor neuropathy. It's going to be ALS. So he had weakness in a polymyotomal distribution, not in a peripheral nerve distribution, and that was even when I first saw him. He had fasciculations of the torso. He had the suggestion of upper motor neuron involvement with the brisk reflexes in that weak and atrophic limb. And the amplitude decrement was modest. In fact, in our multifocal motor neuropathy series, I've actually seen over 50 multifocal motor neuropathy patients because they are sent to me from all over the place, so I'm lucky. Uh, 
I've never seen a patient with symptomatic weakness and a, and a conduction block of less than 80%. So it's not a little bit, it's a lot. And he had uh, denovation in these clinically unaffected muscles. Uh, so with the strange vagaries of the American healthcare system, uh, this patient only came to see me for a single consultation. I was not allowed to follow him up. And his uh, initial neurologist was saying to him, you've got a treatable condition. I was saying to him, you've got ALS. Which would you choose? He chose the treatable condition. He continued to be treated with IVIG almost until the time of his death from ALS, during which time he went on to develop uh, bulbar and respiratory and lower limb and contralateral upper limb involvement. And yet the neurologist persisted in giving him IVIG because he had this magical, non-validated scale that he personally had developed that purported to show improvement, or stabilization, actually. He didn't show improvement, he showed stabilization. So he stable, stabilized to death. And uh, the cost of his IVIG for about two years of treatment was about 250,000 wasted dollars. But on to a happier story. This was a patient I saw quite recently, uh, two years ago. Uh, she saw him shortly before Christmas and gave him the best Christmas present he'd ever received. He had been diagnosed uh, with ALS because of the development of a foot drop that had evolved over about 18 months and was almost complete by the time I saw him. Uh, sometime after this, he developed uh, some left hand weakness. Uh, and, and in fact, when we examined him, he had some right uh, foot drop as well. Uh, but again, so he had, uh, on examination, weakness of median innervated muscles, but not ulna. He had a weakness of anterior tibial muscles bilaterally, um, and he had no bulbar or respiratory involvement. So I thought this was a little bit atypical. He had had nerve conduction studies which showed low amplitude responses but were otherwise not very helpful. But his needle EMG showed no denervation outside the distribution of clinically affected nerves. So we brought him back. Uh, I, you know, I, I just felt this was possible, that it was, it was ALS, but I thought it was a bit unlikely. So we brought him back and did something that uh, probably very few of you have done we looked at sciatic conduction. And so what we did was put in a monopolar stimulating electrode uh, at the sciatic notch and advanced it down to the sciatic nerve and stimulated the nerve percutaneously in this way. And when we stimulated the sciatic nerve at the sciatic notch, this is what we found. So here's the perineal nerve. So, so that, well, that was just a very low amplitude response. Couldn't really learn much from that. This was the side with a mild foot drop. He would have got a completely normal perineal response at the ankle, at the fibula neck, and at the sort of uh, popliteal fossa. Completely normal study. But when we stimulated the nerve at the sci sciatic notch, here we've got this incredibly low amplitude, highly dispersed response. Uh, so clear evidence of focal pathology in the mid portion of the sciatic nerve. The proof, as they say, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, well, we treated him. And in fact, uh, hold on, I don't show the results of his treatment, but I will tell you the results of his treatment. He got better. So his hand and his mildly involved foot returned to normal and his severely involved foot improved, but he still has a significant foot drop because he's got a lot of um, axonal degeneration. So what are the features that help us distinguish between these two somewhat similar conditions? Uh, bulbar involvement is important. It's not never in um, multifocal motor neuropathy. One pa uh, patient has been described with hemiatrophy of the tongue. So it can affect um, cranial nerves. It probably doesn't involve respiratory function. Um, there's a case of phrenic nerve involvement 
that has been suggested but uh, not persuasively. They have no definite upper motor neuron involvement in multivocal motor neuropathy. MMN evolves much more slowly um, and if, if you've got conduction block, that nails it down. And then the distribution of the denervation, if there is denervation in muscles that are clinically unaffected, uh, that's not multifocal motor neuropathy. Uh, so briefly, let me just uh, finish by reviewing the clinical features of MMN. Uh, weakness and atrophy are the quintessential features. Uh, they're invariably found, although the preservation of bulk in clinically weak muscles may be a clue to the diagnosis. Cramps and fasciculations are common in both conditions, so that doesn't help us. But occasionally you'll see myokinia in patients with MMN. Now you don't see it very often, but if it's present it's important because you never see myokinia in ALS. Myokinia is caused by demyelination. So you see it in things like radiation, um, nerve injury, you see it in patients, for example, facial myokinia in people who have MS with demyelination of the root exit zone. Myokinia is a demyelination phenomenon. Uh, in the early stages of the disease, you ought to be able to localize the weakness to the distribution of individual peripheral nerves, and that's important. Don't be lazy in your examination. Absolutely try to distinguish whether this is a myotomal distribution of weakness or a peripheral nerve distribution of weakness. For some curious reason, in MMN, the arms are much more frequently involved than the legs, and no one's ever come up with a satisfactory explanation for that. And it's much more common to get distal muscles involved than proximal. I've seen biceps, like in that uh, index case. Uh, I've seen deltoid, um, but, but usually it's the hand muscles. And I mentioned that uh, one case of hemiatrophy of the tongue has been described, and perhaps a case of diaphragmatic involvement. Uh, they tend to have relative preservation of reflexes, but, but not overtly abnormal reflexes. They don't have brisk reflexes. Uh, usually they have some reflex loss, and as the disease progresses, global areflexia does supervene. Sensation's normal, of course, in both conditions, uh, but the course in MMN is a very slow progression uh, my old mentor, Austin Sumner, uh, thinks it progresses in a stepwise fashion. So it'll progress for a while, and then stabilize, and then progress for a while, and then stabilize, and progress for a while. I, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, but spontaneous improvement has never been described, so uh, that's the downside of it. Uh, the, the quintessential feature is conduction block, and it's o over very, very short segments of nerve, and Chris Crowd did some very nice studies showing that, o over segments of one to two centimeters of nerve. Uh, in, in we reviewed all our data and found that in symptomatic areas, the degree of conduction block is 80% or more. And if you measure conduction across the very short segments in which there is conduction block, Conduction velocity over those short segments is profoundly slowed, but it's over such a short segment that the normal conduction speed along the longer segments of nerve that we traditionally use for, for clinical uh, nerve conduction studies may be normal or may, may be just a little slowed. If for some reason the conduction block can remain fixed and unchanged at one site for many years, maybe even decades. And uh, we not only were the first to describe multifocal motor neuropathy with conduction block, we are also the first to describe multifocal motor neuropathy without conduction block. Now we were careful to say it was without evident conduction block because uh, this, this patient I just told you about whose conduction block was here in the sciatic nerve would not have been picked up in normal study. He would have been called con uh, without conduction block. So we suspect that it's just that the conduction block cannot be identified. The rest of the nerve conduction studies are pretty normal. There may be slight prolongation of distal motor latency, some subtle slowing, perhaps some prolongation of F waves, but really nothing much outside the sites of conduction block. 
And sensory conduction is normal, as we've said, even through the, sex, the segments of severe conduction log. And while EMG shows denervation, it is restricted to clinically affected muscles. I keep making that point because it's important and it's not often uh, appreciated. If you're lucky enough to see myochymia that nails it, or at least it nails that it's not ALS. The lab doesn't help you too much. The CFCF protein is normal. There's no M protein. About 50% of patients will have um, IgM antibodies to GM1 ganglioside if you test using a commercial lab. So Hugh Willison or Alan Pestrong find higher uh, numbers than that, but if you're using a commercial lab, it's only going to be about 50%. Uh, when they are present, they're usually very high titer. So a mild elevation of the titer can occur in CIDP and can occur in ALS, unfortunately. So that has led to misdiagnosis in a number of patients. The treatment of multifocal motor neuropathy is IVIG. There is no other treatment that's been shown to be effective. It has a beneficial effect in about 80% of patients, so it's a pretty good strike rate, but it doesn't cure it. And unfortunately, even with apparently effective treatment, there is a slow decline in muscle strength over decades. So it's not curing anything. There's no consensus about how you should give it, but the half-life of IVIG is about three weeks. And so we tend to like to administer drugs about once a half-life, so that's what we've been trying for the last few years to get people to standardize the approach to treatment at, at a dose about every three weeks. Some people then, when they reduce the dose, increase the intertreatment interval. I personally think that makes no sense at all because now you're not giving the drug once per half-life, you're giving the drug less frequently. So I reduce the dose but persist uh, with the three-week schedule. Uh, Dr. Pestronk uses cyclophosphamide with gay abandon um, and says that it works, but there are no controlled trials, and uh, this is a highly toxic treatment that can induce uh, cancer in a small proportion of patients. It probably does enable you to reduce the IVIG dose, but you pay a price for that, as I say, with the toxicity of the drug. And I've sort of gone away from using cyclophosphamide. I would love to be able to tell you the rituximab works because it's one of my favorite drugs. It ought to work. This is a B-cell mediated disease. Why doesn't rituximab work? But it doesn't. I, I don't know why. Um, and I tried it and in one patient we were able to, sort of like cyclophosphamide, we were able to reduce the IVIG dependence, but uh, no, that was all the only benefit we got. Now, I said previously, it never spontaneously remits, uh, and I've said here, remission's rare, but I, I, I've never seen it spontaneously remit, and it's not really been reported. We talked about progression despite apparently effective treatment. <clears throat> and so to summarize this part, uh, this is a rare disorder. Have you seen a case? Any? Yeah, it's a few. It's a handful around. Uh, I, I asked, the, I asked um, Dr. Thomas at St. John's, he's, he's never seen a case. And he's got a huge practice, so it's a pretty rare disease. Some people say there are more papers written about multifocal motor neuropathy than there are patients with it. Uh, it it's, it's probably, uh, it is an immune-mediated disorder. Uh, whether it's a demyelinating disorder or whether it's a channelopathy is the subject of current controversy. Um, the, the, the hot money is on channelopathy. I'm unpersuaded, but, but I may be wrong there. Uh, treatment is worthwhile. It controls the weakness, but it doesn't induce remission, and progression occurs despite it. So, so this is where I live. I thought I'd show this. And, and the first thing I'd point out to you, there are no cars. And the second thing I'd point out to you is there are no people. 